Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Discussing a Murderer. This is Jeff Jones. With me is a partial, partial panel, just the three guys right now going. Uh, hopefully, Big Jeff will join us later, but let's say hi to Jack. Hey, hey Jack, how are you doing? Hi, uh, hello, everybody. Hello, uh, Jeff and uh, everybody in the uh, live chatters. Doing good. Thanks for uh, having me. Oh, absolutely. Oh, it's open invitation for you, my friend, as well as Dr. Silkman. Dr. Silkman, good morning. Good morning, Jeff, and uh, good morning, Jack, and good morning to everyone in chat. It's great to be here. I cannot believe that we're on the last episode. <laughs> great to be here, and thank you so much. Looking forward to it. On to episode 10. This one is entitled Trust No One. I believe that they are convinced that these issues that we've raised and the scientific testing we've done and the assertions we're making have got to be litigated. We have to have an evidentiary hearing. And so then we talked about the scheduling of it. They want the chance to try to refute the evidence in court. I, I could care less about what they think they can do. I'm not worried about that. Um, the main thing is that Stephen gets another chance in court. We agreed that we wanted the alleged human pelvic bone from the quarry microscopically examined to determine whether or not this bone was a human pelvic bone. We also talked about the car. The logistics are lifting it out of the ground it's in this container but letting us have access to it and examine it you know, there was blood on the outside of the rear cargo door that sherry colhane said she couldn't link to stephen avery there's also male dna on the license plates i you know i, I don't i'm not often stopping it so early guys but i just feel like this is a great time to to hit you up with a question dr silkman and that is She's going to bring all this evidence, and and gosh, I should know uh, the date on this when Making a Murderer came out. But, you know, the, the previous evidence that she just showed was the blood on the back of the Rev, the sh that the way it was characterized, couldn't link to Stephen Avery, okay? Okay, and then we have the license plate, which is right in front of us. And I believe that is, said it was, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe male DNA, but couldn't con connect it to a, a person. Now, my question is, with new technology, is it worth it to try to go back over some of this evidence that Cherie Colhane has deemed, oh, you can't get, you know, it's there's nothing, not, not enough evidence to collect. Well, you know, if I know anything about technology is everything gets better over time and, magna and it's easier to magnify results. So that's kind of my question, if there is one in there for you, Dr. Silkman. Um, molecular biology um, improves on a yearly basis. Uh, all the techniques used in forensic science uh, do improve. Uh, techniques become much more refined. Uh, they also become much more sensitive, uh, which means that in 2005, 2006, when all this testing was going on, um, yeah, I mean, the testing was pretty good back then, but um, it, it's no way in comparison to what is available now. There's new techniques, new methodologies, and, uh, you know, there are many, many cases uh, in which um, evidence is looked at again uh, many, many years later, and uh, new information comes to light. Thank you, Dr. Silkman, for, for answering my question. Uh, Jack, did you have something to add? Well, just, you know, as Doc said, there's uh, other items of evidence that they didn't test, um, one uh, being the memory, the SD memory card found in the cargo area of Teresa's RAV4. Uh, it had DNA on it, and Colhane took a sample, but she didn't run it for to get a profile. And I, I don't, 
you know, other than saying, well, they they already she already had uh, Stephen Avery uh, locked down, so therefore testing stopped. Otherwise, I mean, you know, it always points to to this fact that they weren't looking for the truth; they were looking to convict Stephen Avery. Brendan got sucked into it, but you know, that was their goal: locking Stephen up, shutting down the depositions and the lawsuit, and locking Stephen up. That was the goal. I hope that there is a new testing even beyond, you know, MVAC technology or something, which I think the license plate would be a perfect application. When I interviewed the president of that company, he said, if you can see it, you don't need an MVAC. Um, And so MVAC has been out for a while. So I don't know if we'd be able to consider that new scientific testing for a new K for a new appeal. However, my hope is that there is additional new testing, new technologies, things that, uh, you know, react with different chemicals or there's new sensitivity testing that could be used to justify um, additional evidence uh, testing. So, you know, that's just my my take. I know you guys kind of uh, covered it already, but uh, I would hope that, uh, you know, I've been saying for a while that I hope to see evidence being tested at some point. And, and, and I still sit on that. And I, and that's the hill that I die on Vince. That they said was insufficient quantity for them to test in 05, but this is 12 years later. Steven was saved by a single hair on the rape case. So I just feel like we have to do that. We didn't reach an agreement on the parking light they are very resistant to having it tested. Their position is that she did have that front end damage prior to the 31st of October. Of course, they don't want it to be damaged afterwards because it indicates the car was taken off the property. We think when we examine it, we can figure out what she ran into, what the speed was, what the impact, whether she's running into it, I think it's much more likely that police crashed it into something trying to get it back on the property. Um, there's no doubt that someone picked up that blinker light and put it in the back of the RAV4. It's very interesting that, on, right, guys, on the missing poster, there is no indication of a broken blinker light on the poster. So normally when you're looking for a, a vehicle or a person, you put down distinguishing features that you can look out for like a tattoo or a hair color, or in this case, the RAV4 actually had a blinker-like damage. That wasn't reported. It's very interesting that uh, Pam Stern, when she found the RAV, uh, never mentioned the broken blinker light. Now, that, that could well be because it was partially hidden, but it's very interesting that the blinker light has been a deep six. No one wants to talk about it. And they won't give it to Kathleen Zona. So, so Dr. Silverman, I couldn't agree more. And this is just an example. You know, the state should just simply not be allowed to pull things out of their ass without evidence. They can be in their position all day long um, that the damage was there before the 31st of October. But what proof do they have of that? The only proof they have of it is a debunked story from Ryan Hillegas, who said Teresa Hallback. Uh, filed an insurance claim for it, uh, and, it, and you know, she kept the money. But when they approached the insurance company, the insurance company said, well, there's no such claim. So what proof does the state have of, of this other than some wild assertion that's been proven to be a lie? Oh, 100% Big Jeff, and this, this is the frustrating thing. Um, you know, if the state have got nothing to hide, <laughs> as you say, Big Jeff, what do they continue hiding it? Um, What have they got to lose, right? And remember, Kathleen Zellner said to Stephen, look, when we do the forensic testing, good, bad, or otherwise, the state are going to have uh, access to our findings, right? And so you take a big risk when you do further forensic testing. And Stephen continuously tells Kathleen Zona, test away, test what you can. I believe that the blinker light, the number plates, Uh, A23, the memory card, um, all of them are going to yield very, very important pieces of information. The state won't allow Kathleen Zona uh, to test. It's 
of note to me that they're balking. What it is for me is a red flag. There's something about the parking lot they don't want us to discover. This time we won't leave no stone unturned. A little bit longer and that'll be done. I think once we go to court, I think it should be pretty well over, you know, because there'll be enough there that might should be walking free. I'm not really worried about that once I get into court and that, or if I got to testify. I ain't got no problem with none of that. I think it would be terrific being in the courtroom with Kathleen. She's working hard and it's all going to pay off for her. And especially for me, my freedom. New information just into the Action 2 newsroom. Stephen Avery's latest attempt at a new trial has been denied. The judge turns down a request. Denying Stephen Avery's request for a new trial. A Sheboygan County judge's six-page decision dismissed several claims saying, quote, the defendant has failed to establish any grounds that would trigger the right to a new trial in the interests of justice. Wisconsin Attorney General Brad Schimmel says, quote, I am pleased with the judge's decision, which brings us one step closer to providing justice to Teresa Halbach's family. Yes, we must be very, very sensitive to the needs uh, of, of Teresa's family. It is a very, very sensitive issue because her murder was horrific and senseless. But then again, if you really do want to get justice, allow the forensic testing. If Stephen Avery is guilty, it will show it. In the further forensic, forensic testing, it will demonstrate that he was in the vehicle, right? There's no point in putting up all these roadblocks when you don't have all the answers, right? And this is something that we continuously hear. And people listening to this on the news, they get triggered, right? How dare Stephen Avery and his high-flying attorney uh, try and get a new trial? You know, think of the family, and so that sympathy card, unfortunately, is being played over and over again. You know, Brad Simmel couldn't go, he couldn't go any press conference without bringing the hot box into it. The, the, not the evidence. He's got to bring in, as Doc said, the sympathy card. You know, I'm not a lawyer, you know, mind your law firm, people get what they get. But I think because this, with Stevens' motion, with Sawinski and Resh, I think this brushes really hard on constitutional law, and she knows she has to be very careful uh, because this could really blow up. Because, uh, you know, no matter what we think about Baresh, the Sawinski call was withheld. Would it have made it matter? I, I don't know if it would have or not, but at the time, you know, Stephen's lawyers were not allowed to pursue that line of questioning and where it could have led. They just weren't. Because they were denied access to the recordings, the the, the phone calls, you know. So it, it really it just smacks of hypocrisy. And I know the courts don't necessarily look at that. I'm sure they probably privately they do, but in their rulings they don't look at that. But was it malfeasance? And you know, now is now again. I think they're getting into again. I'm not a lawyer, but you're, they're brushing pretty hard now on constitutional law, but. You know, fairness of trial, discovery, and, and all that shit. So I think by now she really, you know, even with outside consulting with other judges, she should have been able to make a decision. She's had time. Avery had requested a new trial, claiming he was set up after filing a $36 million lawsuit against Manitowoc County. But today, a Sheboygan County judge issued a decision in order saying that no further consideration will be given to this issue.
Okay, get the state's diary. You're going to do the, the appellate date motion to reconsider. Okay. I got your email and I read the opinion. What a disappointment. Well, I mean, I think that there's a bunch of things wrong with it because there's five issues that we raised that she didn't even address. And then within those issues, there's specific allegations that total over 50 different items that she hasn't addressed. Um, we had an agreement with the prosecutors for the attorney general that we were gonna amend that we were going to do an evidentiary hearing. We're even talking about the scheduling of it. And then she just abruptly issued this very cursory opinion. You know that, because she probably didn't yet know about the agreement with the AG, did she? No. Okay, so, I mean, I don't know what the AG is willing to do with you now, but the best option, I think, would be if you get the AG on board with an agreement stipulated order to withdraw this opinion. Okay. Yeah, I think that's what our plan... Well, we communicated with them. We sent an email out um, as soon as we got her order, and they responded saying that they would talk to us tomorrow. I'd be drafting up a motion that you'd be confident they would sign on to as well. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and, and have that ready to go for your discussion tomorrow. Yeah, that's what I think, that we've got to file it, like, right away. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Wow, what a fascinating kind of behind-the-scenes understanding of how law is brokered and dealt with. Uh, Jack, I'll open it up to you, I guess. Well, I think this uh, showcases uh, the deception of Tom Pilon. I think he's in the spotlight. I think he was in the spotlight from the from the get go. He lied about eighty six seven eight six seven five with the bones. He knew they were gone. He knew he was there. Yet he dealt with her with Kathleen all through that process. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He never brought up, hey, these we gave this shit away back in two thousand eleven. You're screwed. It shows the de utter deception and contempt that they would stoop to. These are high balloon lawyers. This is an assistant attorney general, a seasoned one. He's been there for decades. He knew what he was doing. Uh, in order to seek justice, there are many impediments. Uh, it's a very time consuming. It is very expensive. Um, and all the wheelings and dealings. And I'll tell you what, um, Tom Fallon, he's a legal eagle. He's a guru in Wisconsin law. Uh, and, and a snake. Oh, yeah. He's, he's also very, very crafty and sneaky uh, and did his absolute utmost best to white ant and pull the rug under Kathleen Zona. And just yet another uh, example of how the state is desperate to avoid any type of evidentiary hearing. Ahead and start drafting a motion to vacate yeah, so we could based on the Fallon. agreement. You know, I would like to be diplomatic about this opinion, but it's hard to do that when I've got somebody's life at stake and on the receiving end of it is someone who obviously um, doesn't, who, who's making fundamental mistakes about the underlying facts in the case, and then is trying to go one-on-one -on -one with our scientist. It's just not at all what a judge should be doing. She should be having a hearing, weighing the evidence and determining credibility. Then she could decide if she wants to deny it, fine. But then we all have the benefit of the appropriate record to take up on appeal. But the message we're getting is we want you and your team and your experts to go away. And we want Stephen Avery to die in prison. Quietly, please, quietly. Stop looking at it. Stop talking about it. Hello? Hey, hi. Hey, how are you? I'm oh, pretty good. Good, good. So you haven't actually seen the opinion, right? No. Yeah, because what the judge is trying to do is say, 
because you and your pro se petition utter the words ineffective assistance of counsel, she wants to bar all future references to that in our petition. So I may be raising your ineffectiveness as a, in your petition. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? I mean, really, when you think about it. The main thing though is tomorrow, I'm gonna to talk to uh, Tom Fallon about our agreement to do this additional testing. And that's when we'll find out, are they going to try to deny we have an agreement? Are they, what are they gonna tell us? So that'll be kind of key. If they agree that we have the agreement, which we did in fact get from them, then we would try to file a motion to vacate her order. Yeah, um, that would be good. That's, that's the quickest way to correct this. Unless they're backdooring us, the DA is. Yeah, that's the thing that we have to clarify tomorrow. The prosecutor, Tom Fallon, is acting as surprised as we are that the judge issued this ruling. The guy is a complete strategist. He's, he's five steps ahead of everybody. That's the way he works. The part that I caught out of that was my little uh, folksy saying, as I like to call him, of Stephen, and how Stephen can sum up everything in five words. And he said, unless the DA is backdooring us. And I think he did it. That's, so we'll let Stephen have the last word on that one. <laughs> unless the DA is backdooring us. Well, you think something's going to happen, and you just get shut down. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. kind of used to that. That's why I didn't get worried about nothing. Me either. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've been in so many situations where, I mean, I guess just like this, where you look, you know, a trial judge does something, and you're just perplexed by it. But you can't let it get to you emotionally, don't, don't no. you think? Well, yeah, because, you know, you figure that the EA didn't file nothing, so why is she ruling? You know, and it didn't make no sense to me. Yeah, so what I want to do is shape for the appellate court, because my experience has been it's the appellate, it's the higher courts that make the decisions to exonerate someone. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we'll talk then tomorrow. All right, then. Take care of yourself. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. What happened to him in 1985 with uh, the Penny Bernstein um, assault, he's seen it all before, right? And remember, he had to sit in court with his family, with his mother and his father, with the DA and the sheriff telling him that he wasn't at home with his kids, with his family, with his friends, pouring concrete, that he was in actual fact on a beach assaulting Penny Bernstein. Now, if you're Stephen Avery, you you must be thinking, wait a minute, this is the twilight zone. And to think and imagine that it's occurring again to him, I just, m most people would have gone insane. But he's keeping his faculties together. But the sad thing is, he's been through it all before. So what we have to finalize is we have to present it to the prosecutors in a certain way. So they don't, I don't want them to feel like we're trying to backdoor them in any way. It's got to be presented exactly like it went down at the meeting. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let me guess here, guys. Let me guess here, guys. Tom Fallon is doing a Sergeant Schultz. I know nothing. Right, guys? I know nothing. <laughs> Thank you.
Then we need to put in a paragraph about today's conversation. We ought to say prosecutors stated that they would not, uh, stated that they would not join in the motion, uh, but they would not object to it. Okay, on 10. Additionally, prosecutors and defense counsels agreed that if an evidentiary hearing was necessary to resolve the issues in the amended petition, the evidentiary hearing could last four weeks or more. We could say the defendant did not anticipate uh, current order. Yeah, the court filing its order uh, before the defendant could notify yeah. the court. So Kurt, so I've got the um, file stamp. So it's on there. He forwarded it to you. So send it to all of the media outlets. I'll put up a tweet on it. The email's ready and I will have the attachment. Okay, so now we'll see what happens. At least we know we've done our part. Now we'll come at her with an amended petition. Yeah. Like right away. We'll just, idea is just to make her feel like <laughs> I think, she's I think being bombed. Work. Yeah. We're doing. Uh, I think it'll work. Yeah. For something to think about. Is she you really going to preclude the testing, you yeah. know, that we've agreed to? I mean, yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. But you never know. So if, if you're dealing with somebody who really doesn't have a conscience, Right. Or, or, or who the, you know, who is a confident that the state has set up to say this guy needs to go away, then it's, it's perfectly understandable that she does what she does. And she said, yeah, I don't care that you had all this set up. I don't care that might be meaningful evidence discovered out of it. All that really matters is that Stephen Avery stays in prison. And I don't care how unreasonable my uh, rulings get. Um, I'm just going to keep on making them uh, against Stephen Avery. And that's, that's you know, you, it, even if laying out the script that, um, in, you know, so, sort of that forwardly, um, that, that's exactly what's happening. If, even, even though I'm being a little facetious and tongue in cheek, right? I mean, she just, just doesn't care. Uh, Kathleen just made some uh, very eloquent arguments as to why, um, you know, this should be com completely accepted. It was set up beforehand. Um, there's potential evidence to be found. Uh, new testing available. Why not? Why, you know, what is in the interest of justice for, you know, the people of Wisconsin? Stephen Avery is one of the people of Wisconsin. He deserves justice, as does Teresa Halbach. It's just, it is unfathomable to me um, that that motion uh, that did, did, to, for testing did not succeed because the state, you know, well, they didn't object to it. You know, if, they, if, if the state had no objection, what business does the judge have in saying, no, uh, you know, there's, there's no possible way it can prove anything anyway. This is kind of what Kelly has been saying all along, right? Um, that all the state has to do is say, well, you know, that doesn't mean that Stephen Avery didn't do it, it no matter whatever you find. Well, uh, I, I mean, it really is very, very frustrating. And for Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey, they've got a very high bar that they have to jump over uh, in order to uh, seek justice. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's actually very, very simple. Um, it's all about protection of the verdicts because uh, the state has got way too much to lose. And remember, uh, Tom Fallon was one of the prosecuting attorneys. So hence, if both Stephen and Brendan Dassey get exonerated and get released, this is going to be a blight on their professional careers, something that they're not going to recover from. Because with Stephen you've got the um, individual who now can be potentially exonerated twice, falsely convicted twice. Uh, that's almost unprecedented, right? So the state has got too much to lose. A uh, Judge Angie knows this. So she's putting up as many impediments as possible. And you're correct, Big Jeff. How frustrating that even though Kathleen Zona is finding all these new witnesses, coming up with all this new forensic evidence, new data. The judge keeps on throwing it back to her to say, well, how do you know it wasn't Stephen? So even not that they cannot admit that it was another third party, somebody else involved, they keep on blaming Stephen. Um, they put Stephen in a cage. They don't want him out.
does it, you know, deter me? No, it renews my focus. Something much more devastating happened in the Ryan Ferguson case. And I remember I was sitting in Doug's office and when I stood up, it just kind of, it was like someone had punched me in the stomach. Um, but then that feeling like lifted and then I just felt a very controlled rage about what I was gonna do to undo it. So Je Jeff, um, can you hear me okay? I'm sorry. I... Loud and clear, buddy. Oh, okay, great. Um, the, the world needs more people like Kathleen Zellner. Um, not, not only is she a person who stands up to injustice, but she actually seeks out injustice so she can stand up for those who uh, the injustice has been perpetrated upon. And not only that, but people email her or try and contact her about these, these injustices. And when she says, like, I felt this, you know, controlled rage, just tells you how she feels about when she sees injustices that she has the chance to be able to counteract. That that is a person that that's a person of integrity. That that is a that is a, a rare person with a desire to help other people and the skill to help other people, uh, like, like I've never seen before. What 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 an, what an impressive person, um, you know, with a skill set that's desperately needed today. So I mean, uh, kudos to Kathleen Zellner and hats off. This is what she does day in and day out. She's an attorney. She understands the law. And she looks at uh, wrongful convictions, cases of wrongful convictions. And in a way, what she's doing and what she's highlighting are the flaws in the system, the uh, impediments for an individual in order to seek justice. And Kathleen Zona said, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but the average time is between 50 and 20 years uh, before someone can get exonerated in a lot of cases. So... It highlights the importance of getting the very first court case done correctly. You know, it's, it's like she said here a few minutes ago. They just want us to quietly go away, stop talking, and for Stephen Avery to die in prison quietly. Just leave it alone. That's what they want. Well, you know, not being lawyers, we're, we're advocates, we're, you know, continuing to talk about these cases Um you know, some would say ad nauseum. I'm okay with that label. I, I don't care because it, it needs to, we need to continue to talk about it, even if we're talking about material that we've already talked about before. We can talk better about it now. You know, you have these guilters that like, well, you know, Stephen and Brenda are going to die in prison, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, why are you here? Why do you care? Go, just, if you're, if you're convinced, why are you here arguing with me and what I'm presenting? You know, to Jack, other people? I want to add to that. I, I, yeah. I, I really I really want to add to that because I've been saying the same thing for a while. Like, what is your motive? Why would you be here? But we just heard that Schimmel say, you know, if, if we can beat this last appeal, then the Hall Box will finally have justice. Like, what do you mean? They already have justice. He's locked up. The justice exactly. has been served. So what are you exactly. talking about? Like, the logic isn't even there when they bring up the stuff. So, yeah, that kind yeah. of triggered something in me, Jack, what you said. So I appreciate yeah. it. I have two comments to that. For, first is, whatever you, you you can call me, you know, I've been called a lot of things on, on Reddit and, and, uh, and other things. Don't call me a fan. Uh, don't, don't call me a fan of Stephen Avery or, or Brendan Dassey. Exactly. That, 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 that is condescending. That is not what I am. I am a researcher, uh, part of this community. Uh, I want the truth. And if the truth is that Stephen Avery is guilty, I'm perfectly willing to accept that truth. Right. Same here. Um, I, 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 I have not seen, you know, the, the I, I saw a heavily weighted unfair trial. I see the state continuing to say, well, you can't test this. You can't test that. Leads me to believe that they have something to hide. I, I, don't, I don't believe somebody should be in prison with, with the state having something to hide, right? The state tries to hide a lot of stuff, There's a lot of fishy stuff that happened on this, uh, uh, happened on this case. We, we have about, uh, what, to, uh, to 40 hours of uh, <laughs> 40 hours of fishiness if you want to go over it, right? Um, we're, we're here to seek justice.
because it wasn't a fair trial. They knew they knew precisely what they were doing. Yeah, you know, e- even just the most basic thing, even more basic, uh, really, than you know, getting in the step up to you know forensic testing. We're just talking about simply discovery material and, and things that the prosecutor was lawfully abl- uh, 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 obligated to turn over to uh, first Loy, then uh, Strang and Beauty, and he didn't. Some of the stuff didn't make it into evidence until after the trials were done, or at least after the, um, uh, the, the well, maybe before the uh, verdicts were read, but some of it was, it was pre-trial. too late. Dude. Right, pre-trial, yeah, some of it pre-trial, like the audio, right? Remica, oh, I, I, what did you do to, to prepare? I listened to the audio. There's audio? Right? I yeah. Mean, <laughs> and they'd been trying to get it for months and didn't didn't get anything. And when they did get uh, you know, some audio from uh, the state, it was 30 calls out of thousands. Then they were undated, un, uh, well, metadata removed. So that, that tells you the, the, the utter disregard for proper procedure. Do it right, guys. If, it, if you're convinced, let the evidence prove it. I'm a fan of the truth. And here's the bottom line. For any, for any real truther, they want everything, and I mean everything, on the table. The guilter does not. They don't. Sometimes you, unfortunately, do waste your breath and your time um, discussing certain parameters with guilters because they refuse to listen. They refuse to acknowledge that you've made a very good point, not to try and show off or, or be a smart ass but actually to highlight uh, areas where where they are deficient. And at the end of the day, you must say to yourself, how would I feel if myself or a family member was treated in the same way during the trial that Stephen and Brendan were? Put yourself in their shoes. And if you think they were treated fairly, then uh, you know I think you need to go back to school again. And all we really want is for justice, Justice for Teresa, justice for Stephen and Brendan, and wherever the chips fall, they fall. Exactly. You know, and I'll pass on this one more thing before we continue. I've been in this uh, debate with a guilter, and uh, you know they're coming along. Well, you know you can't prove that because we're talking. I was talking about the burn pit. You can't prove the bones were planted. Blah blah blah, and just going on and on. So I put up the November sixth photo that Re- Trooper Reese took. There's no pile of bones there. And we have multiple officers say that there was a pile of bones in that burn pit. Right, guys? Uh, no. Correct. Sturdivant. Correct. Sturdivant made that comment. And uh, it's really remarkable, Jack61, because that picture there, the pictures by Trooper Reese, are really, uh, uh, they uh, exculpate Stephen and Brendan because something drastically happened between November the 6th and November the 8th, when all the forensic evidence was being found coming out of the skies, and especially the cremains. And uh, you ask a guilty, oh, all right, show me a video or photographs of any bones that are in situ in that burn pit. They'll run a mile. Absolutely. And uh, he wants to ignore that photo. He wants to talk around, start calling me names, and all that, which, you know, I expected. that. I'm okay with that. I'm, I, got, I got tough skin, thick skin, too. And... Um, so this this type of conversation continues with those from the other side. Anything that points to innocence, they want to completely they completely ignore it and don't want to talk about it. Oh uh, yeah, that, that that is a very very common theme, and I've had some very interesting discussions regarding the uh, DNA forensic evidence, and it's very interesting that none of them ever admit to ever being in a laboratory were actually working with DNA, and they all believe experts, and then they try and challenge my own credentials, and I'm the one with the three university degrees, and I and I never <laughs> boast about it as well, which goes right. to show we are gentlemen, we are wasting our time with certain individuals. No doubt. <laughs> So if I could just pile on that last one, Jack 61, true or false? The publicity that Manitowoc got after making a, mur- uh, making a murder came out was so bad. They actually hired a public relations firm to try and, uh, uh, to, to, to try and set things right. 
And those fat public relations firms did things like post on social media to help Banatwak's case. True or false? True. Very true. True. Where, where are these guilters from? So you want to ask yourself, where, where, where might some of these guilters be from, especially ones from a few years back when MAM2 was in, was in its heyday? Paid yep. PR from Manitowoc County. That's, That's where they're right. from. That's where That's they're exactly from. Right. That's right. So, That's right. That's right. Yeah. So you want to hear you want to hear things that you don't hear on MAM? There's one of them for you right there. In the Wisconsin statute, motions to reconsider can be filed even years later uh, with new evidence. So we put all of the new evidence in. We focused on these porn searches and on Bobby Dassey. We attached the affidavit of his brother, Brian, which is flatly contradicted Bobby's trial testimony. We focused on all the suspicious activities with Scott Toddick, and we had our Brady witness that placed the car close to Scott Toddick's residence. So we pack all the new evidence into our motion to reconsider. Stephen Avery's attorney is pushing once again for a new trial. In this motion, Avery's attorneys claim Bobby Dassey's computer had pictures on it of dead bodies of young women. She also claims Hallback and her vehicle left the Avery property. Zellner alleges Bobby Dassey and his now stepfather, Scott Tadich, gave false testimony to cover up that they assaulted Hallback on a highway after she left Avery's property. What the fuck is going on? What's going on? Yeah. Why is she starting up with Scott and Bobby again? Well, it's going wherever the, the evidence is going. So she's going to take down my fucking family again? If that's where the lead is going to go, I don't know. And fucking better not, because you'll have a dead sister. Well? Yeah. Well, I don't think it was. It's kind of him, is it? I'm sure she was reeling, you know, uh, from this filing that that Kathleen made. I, I I get it, you know. We're we're family people. We understand. At the same time, uh, I I think that you know she's unsophisticated, like a lot of uh, folks, and they don't understand the process of what Kathleen is trying to do. So anyway, I, I think that's true as well. And, you know, I, I also I also think that, um, you know, from, from where Kathleen Zellner was sitting, uh, given that the, the evidence that she had and the affidavits that she had, I don't necessarily think that the conclusion that she came to was uh, was was ill founded. Uh, I think no. I think that the you know, I think that uh, since then. Uh, you know, as good truthers, there's been a lot of good research in the community. Uh, I think, uh, you know, our friend Cal, who we miss desperately on, on the podcast, is leading the way in one of those areas of research, um, you know, that, 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 that is pretty much informing us that, that, you know, that all of those porn searches were not done at, uh, at, at, at Bobby's hands. Now, that, that doesn't completely undermine Kathleen Zellner's argument. It certainly weakens it some. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, she, she was, uh, you know, answering, you know, she, she was, she was developing a theory based upon the evidence that that's on hand. Now she has, yeah. you know, more different evidence and she's pursuing different lines. She's doing exactly what she should do. And again, Bobby Dassey is in no danger at all of anything happened to him. There's just simply not sufficient evidence uh, to do anything more than ask him a few questions, but there is sufficient evidence, uh, in my, in my, in my mind. To name, uh, you know, and again, that's my, that's our law firm, and we're only slightly, slightly above Marquette Law School in this, Jack. Not, uh, not a lawyer. <laughs> not saying that we are, just a tiny bit better than those out of Marquette. Um, <laughs> that, you know, that that, Bob, that Bobby does make a great Denny, um, and uh, I hope Kathleen succeeds in, uh, you know, in her endeavor to get him officially named one. I have my, you know, my, my reservations about why she might not. I hope she does. And, and, in, and in that hope, I am 100% confident that nothing in the world, except for a few questions, will be asked to Bobby or maybe even Scott Tanish because they just have simply enough evidence to lock them up. It's all about reason of creating a reasonable doubt and uh, addressing the violation of the constitutional rights of Stephen Avery, uh, which, which are that he has the right to name a suspect who meets a certain threshold during his trial or right that he was denied 
That's all the Denny motion's about. So again, name me a Denny if you want. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that Denny. it's I think it's hypocritical that we wouldn't, you know, just think just for a minute as reasonable people that that computer's in that house. There's, uh, you know, three or four brothers that are around it, teenage guys, young guys, plus their friends that come in. If it's not monitored, what are teenage boys going to do? They're going to look. I promise you, they're going to look. <laughs> well, I did when I was a teenage boy. Not maybe not at that, but <laughs> I, I raced. I raced. I, well, yeah, we didn't have that kind of stuff then. But certainly, if we, you know, if one of the neighborhood boys' uh, dads had a Playboy or whatever, yeah, you bet you we're going to look. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> and the same thing here. And again, plus their friends that came over. And if that shit goes unmonitored, hey, it's open season. Uh, look, there's there's no doubt, and there's nothing wrong in either uh, males or females being curious, uh, looking at um, sexual material. That that's that's human nature. I don't think that's being called into question. What is being called into question is the type of material that was being viewed and downloaded. Uh, some of the material was disturbing, uh, whether it was Bobby Dassey, whether it was uh, Brendan, Brian, I any of the boys that were there. Uh, some of the material that was being viewed and downloaded was extremely disturbing. That's point number one. Point number two, we mustn't forget that it was actually Mark Wiegert uh, who mentioned to a reporter exactly what he was expecting to find on Stephen Avery's computer, torture porn, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right, guys, and it was even in a newspaper clipping. So this then muddies the water. So why is Mark Wieger allowed to say these comments in regards to what he expected to find on Stephen's computer, and yet that material wasn't found on Stephen's computer, was found on the computer in the Dassey residence. I'm not saying that Bobby Dassey viewed some or all of the material. We do not know. But what is good for the goose is good for the gander. And it was the state, a senior investigator, who put that out there in the media. The problem for the state was that incriminating material that Mark Wiggett thought was going to be on Stephen's computer wasn't. It happened to be on a computer in the Dassey household. And why is this so significant? Because of Bobby Dassey's testimony during the trial about seeing Teresa Horbach walk towards Stephen's trailer, right? So hence, if the defence were able to put out in court, hey, look what happened to be on um, the computer in the Dassey residence. Oh, yes, Bobby lied. He wasn't asleep. He was on the computer. That type of stuff is damaging, right? Damaging from the state's perspective. So I just wanted to say, guys, we need a balance to this approach. Well, that does seem like it's a pretty good time for us to give her the wrap-up. So, Big Jeff, uh, we'll throw it back over to you to lead off the wrap-up comments for us. A lot of scene here again in this episode. I think episode 10 is going to hit on a lot of different issues, guys. So... Buckle up. Big Jeff, the floor is yours. Yes, I apologize for missing the first uh, you know, 10 minutes or so of the, of the, uh, of the, of the um, introduction. But boy, this was, uh, you know, it, it, it already started with the, uh, the hitting of multiple um, topics, as, as, you, as you said. Uh, you know, the one, the one that uh, gets me the most, uh, you know, the one, that, the one that I walked in on is just the, the, the need for further testing of, uh, for, uh, of, of various evidence. Um, and the, the, the lack of um, you know, rigor that the state used in collecting the evidence in the first place. Um, you know, that goes, that goes all the way from the, you know, from the bones to the initial discovery of the RAV. Uh, one thing we didn't mention during that was the, uh, we have no in situ photos of the seagull shaped blood stain on the, uh, you know, near, near the ignition, right? You know, we have, uh, you know, a swab like looking, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, imprint, if you will, near the ignition, um, but we have no uh, original picture of what it looked like before anybody took that swab. So, 
yeah, okay, show, show, show me that. It's just the, these things, these things come up all over the place. They did a poor job of collecting, documented how, documenting how they did collect it. Didn't even invite the right people who knew how to collect it onto the yard in the first place. And we have a pile of bones uh, that people talk about, yet nobody can show us a picture of. So, you know, the, 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 the case against uh, Stephen and Brendan is, you know, really made up in a lot, in, in a lot of places out of complete vaporware where there's no foundation uh, for the discovery of evidence that subsequently, subsequently collected and put into the record. Um, you know, moving on to that, we have the surprise verdict from Judge and Angie that further, uh, that, uh, sorry, that stopped further uh, forensic examination of items like the, uh, of, of, of the RAB4 and Tom Fallon, you know, being you know, mysteriously shocked that the judge ruled at the time that she did uh, and, uh, you know, kind of laughing behind the scenes and saying, oh yeah, I have at it trying to get this test done now. So, you know, <laughs> really just a, uh, you know, a, a, a full scale demonstration of sort of the, the mountain that Kathleen Zellner has to climb uh, when dealing with corruption in the state of Wisconsin. Um, so that's a much longer, <laughs> sorry to go on and on, probably making the summary longer than the show, but, but um, it's really time to get on to the next. No, I, I don't think you're disappointing uh, anyone with a, with a long wrap up comment there, Big Jeff. And I know you're not disappointing Dr. Silkman with a long wrap-up comment either. So, Dr. Silkman, we'll throw it over to you for your summation well, and wrap-up today. You know, I, I always get a little bit depressed when uh, Big Jeff is not on because his uh, summations of, of the episode are just absolutely spot on. Uh, and I really, really hope everyone in, the, uh, in chat really appreciates uh, Big Jeff's summations. I wanted to say uh, what a fantastic episode I really love the maturity of the panel that we can discuss all all type of uh, um, material that's covered within the show. It is indeed very controversial. It is very frustrating. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't wait to get on with the next one. It's been awesome. Thank you very much, guys, and everyone in chat. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Silkman. And, uh, Jack, we're going to have give you the responsibility of leading us out of Episode 43? Wow. Ooh. Yeah, I'm telling you. Well, I mean, I, I can't really add much to uh, Doc and especially Big Jeff's uh, summation and comments. We, we covered actually quite a bit of ground in this one. Uh, a big range of emotions. Yeah, You know, talking about um, Judge Angie and, and her sudden just slamming the door shut. Uh, and and it, I mean, there's so much surrounding that whole thing. I could talk for well, I could talk all day about it, um, but it is what it is. And then what Kathleen was left to dealt with at the time, you know, um, in, in today's terms, you know, I think she's continuing to do what she has to do to try to get her foot in the door for an evidentiary hearing. Um, even if it's a somewhat limited scope, I still think this can raise many other questions. You never know what ha what's going to happen in a hearing. You, you just don't know. And what that could prompt. So, I think that um, from then till now, you know, we have seen Kathleen try to do what she can, what she has to do to free her client, which I, I fully believe she thinks is innocent, or she would not still be part of that case. She wouldn't. She started in January of 2016, and here we are in mid June, 2023, and she's still here. So that tells me she fully believes in. Um, the guy's innocence, and there's no doubt. Even Brendan, she's not his lawyer, but I mean, he was included. So I think that um, I'm going to stop there and say on to the next. And thanks, everybody, and uh, the live chat and my other panel members. Yeah, thank you for that, Jack. I appreciate that. And uh, I also appreciate everybody out there in live chat and people who've been following along with us. I know. Some of us said, oh, I finally got caught up on all the episodes. I can watch one live now. So congratulations if you made it and caught up and you're all live with us just catching into the last few episodes. So, yeah, episode 10, we're on the last episode, guys, and uh, more fireworks to come, uh, a lot more iPad smashing to come, and I'm sure a lot more great wrap-up uh, comments to be had. So, for Big Jeff and Dr. Silkman and Jack and for Kel at home, this is Jeff Jones saying this has been discussing a murderer. <laughs>